Welcome to another Deep Adaptation Q&A with me, your host, Jem Bendel. And our guest this month is Zori Tomova, who's known to many of you, uh, I would have thought, um, because she was a coordinator of the Deep Adaptation Forum for quite some time in the early days as we were setting it up. And uh, Zori, I met in Bali, uh, and Zori became a, a good friend. Um, Zori became a coach for me as well through a very difficult time as I was making sense of who I am or wanted to be with the new knowledge that I had, which was real and true for me about the state of the planet and the future. Uh, and then also Zori created something back then called the Connection Playground, which was a uh, her response to the information that she was hearing about the state of the world. And so um, that was also really important in my own uh, reconstitution of self, really. Um, so yeah, so Zori's been a, a companion on my journey over the last four years now. And Zori is uh, joining us from Guatemala, I believe. Is that right? Good. So I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to unmute and uh, say hello. It's in the evening where you are, isn't it? So, um, but... Are you? Yeah, unmute, unless you've got, I, I, yeah, please unmute to join us. Okay. So, um, and just say hello so we know that your mic's working. Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's an honor for me to be here. Uh, just like Jem was sharing, it's been a while that we've known one another. And actually, he's been, a meeting Jem has been a big, big turning point for me and a big inspiration for everything that I've been doing and I am today. And so it's really a big um, honor for me to be here with all of you and to return to the Deep Adaptation Forum as uh, this work is very close to my heart. So thank yeah, you. thank you, Zori. And when we scheduled this, hmm, maybe a month or so ago, we knew how stressful the world is because of environmental change, because of polarization, because of pandemic and pandemic policies and polarization of that, because of ongoing conflict in the world, seems to be war happening everywhere. But, but obviously, uh, what's alive for a lot of us right now. And so I thought I'd mention it um, on the, you know, uh, in America, the 26th of February, 2022. Um, yeah, there's uh, an invasion within Europe is, is, is big news and is, there's such a history <laughs> around that and such a traumatic history that, um, uh, yeah, and any conflict with nuclear powers is also, really scary for everyone, not just those currently involved on the ground, which is also really, really awful. So I wanted to mention it. And in a way, it's almost like I feel like we should should go straight into that, because I do because I already want to ask you about how you came to where you've got to with the work you do, particularly how that was not by blocking out your sense of the way the world is, um, but in response to it. But yeah, go straight into the deep end. You know, we, we've titled this session, The Wisdom of Play in Times Like These. So times like these, when a new war is on involving a nuclear power and, and talking to our friends and family and on looking on social media, this, um, yeah, it's affecting people a lot. Um, people are all debating what to do, how to respond various ideas being shared on that, lots of uh, upset as well being shared about lack of responses. Um, the obvious question is, isn't focusing on play, frivolous, self-involved, distracting, and irrelevant to uh, the cause of reducing harm, bringing peace and justice, into the world. Thank you, Jen, for asking this question. I've been wondering 
about the same. And what's been coming up for me is basically I see this war that has just erupted um, as a very important invitation to come back in ourselves and in our communities and ask ourselves, how are we contributing to the peace in this world? How can we restore peace within ourselves, within our close circles, and then from there also in the collective? It might not happen. Not all of us might have the opportunity to influence global politics in the way that some others have, um, but we do have that within, which is within our control, which is how do we be at peace inside of ourselves and with one another? And then what is the role that play has to do with that? Like what role does play play in it? Um, it also comes down to the way that we define play. Uh, so for me, play is not just the frivolous jumping around, enjoying life. Play is a, a way of um, exploration, a way of exploring what are some different ways of being with one another. Play is also a way of coming back to a beginner's mind, a mind that acknowledges, hey, I don't know what's going on. And, and I might as well come together with others and sort of a playground as we like to call the gathering spaces that we assemble in online right now in the connection playground as a way to really make our way through what's going on. So play is not necessarily something that um, at least in, in my definition of the world where it is associated with, um, with the frivolousness. It can be that, it can be a lightness. Um, but it's, it can go much deeper than that. It can go into exploring, how do we explore the unknown that is ahead of us? How do we make sense of it? How do we find a different way of being with it? So that's the significance I see right now in this moment. And you've, in what you've just said, you've reminded me of, of my experience of your initiative, the Connection Playground. When, when, when it was happening in person and I, I came along to events, which was, it, I didn't see it as just how am I going to go and have fun right now? I saw it as what does my body need? What does my soul need? What does my mind need? What is going to help nourish and heal me so I can be more fully engaged in whatever's happening? Um, I definitely felt that and I definitely got that from it. But before we dive more into that, I want to also invite Katie, who's providing tech uh, support for us today, just to make an announcement about how, how you can all uh, engage and ask questions at some point later on in, in, our, in our session today. Thank you, Jim. So for about the next 20 minutes or so, half of this, uh, gathering, Jem and Zori will be in conversation, but if you would like to uh, ask Zori a question yourself, then you can do that by sending it to me as a direct message in the chat and um, be prepared. So I'm going to drop you a line <clears throat> to let you know if Jem's going to call on you to ask your question. Um, and there is an assumption. We will be assuming that by submitting a question that you agree to be uh, recorded as part of this event and the recording is going to be listed on Jem's YouTube channel. If you would rather not have your voice and image on that, you can let me know in the chat and I can ask the question on your behalf. Um, and yeah, so be prepared to turn your video on when we call on you and I will invite you to, uh, to unmute yourself. And we're this is an um, intimate group, so there's an opportunity to hear from lots of you. So, yeah, please do send your, uh, your questions directly to me in the, as a private message in the chat. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Um, when I first met you, you were talking about your background in... Um, 
in IT, in logistics, in performance optimization. You were talking about startups and all the work you've done with startups. And you were talking about looking at maybe creating a, some kind of plastics recycling business or other environmental businesses. And then after a conversation we had, within a few weeks, you'd completely changed direction. Could you just go back to that time and, and tell us what happened? Because I think it's many people on this call and many people who um, watch this, our conversation, uh, will be either in the process of reassessment and and perhaps becoming someone new because of the kind of stuff that we talk about in the deep adaptation world. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I remember uh, first meeting you, Jim, I was already in this process of letting go of that kind of life that you just described. I was an entrepreneur. I was working in the field of startups and IT for quite a few years. And actually, a big part of my, my journey um, was realizing that the work I was doing was not close to my heart. And um, this was the reason I found myself in Bali in order to explore and find what else might it be that I could offer to the world and I could, uh, yeah, shape my life around. And I remember at first when I arrived, I started playing with this idea of, okay, I saw a lot of plastic that was washed up on the shore in Bali. And I was thinking, okay, so like maybe I could do something to solve that although I have absolutely no background or experience in that field, it just was hurtful for me to watch that happen. And, um, and then I started exploring like what might be some solutions there. And I remember coming to this like dead end where this whole idea of problem solution, um, just, just the mindset of, oh, there is a problem and let me solve it. Uh, started disintegrating because I thought, well, how can I guarantee that whatever solution I come up with to this problem does not end up creating even more problems <laughs> that afterwards need to be solved or even, you know, even bigger pollution or bigger issues. Um, and so actually when I met you, I was in that, in that state of like just this whole idea, this whole mindset of I need to find problems to solve um, was disintegrated and I had no idea of how I orient myself in this, like if there is no problem solution, then what am I doing here? Um, and then, and then when, you, when I met you and when you shared with me about your findings about our climate, I remember um, my first reaction was like, oh, you know, you were you were speaking about, oh, maybe in, in 10 years time, civilization collapses. And then, you know, even people like you and me, we might be gone in that process. Uh, it might mean death, actually. And and I remember asking myself, well, what if this is true? What if I'm one of those people that will just die in this process of um, civilization collapsing? And. I said to myself, well, then I better make sure I live until that happens. Um, and then I asked myself, but what does it mean to live? How do I know I have lived a full life? And my answer was, well, I feel alive when I feel connected, when I feel fully present and engaged with other people, with nature, with myself. Um, and then does it really matter if I die tomorrow or in 10 years or in 50 years? If connection is what makes me feel alive, then that's what I should commit to and live according to. And I should follow this thread of experience um, that connection is pointing me to. And in a way, if we do bring back that mindset of problem and solution, um, it does strike me as something that um, our world needs very much right now reconnecting with ourselves, one another and nature, as uh, all of our progress has created a lot of disconnect, a lot of isolation and a lot of mental and physical suffering for many of us. 
So um, for this, I'm forever grateful to Jim for, for bringing this um, awareness because it really helped me to align to the gifts that are mine to give and who I am today. And it, it, it became a, it wasn't just about you having, you living differently and you having fun in a different way. You created an organization, you created a framework, you invited people in to join you in that initially physically in offline and then and then then online when the pandemic hit. Could you say a little bit more about what Connection Playground is and and where it's got to now a few years later? Yes. So um, this uh, um, awareness of connection being something that I would like to focus on in the face of mortality um, also came with an awareness that I don't necessarily know what connection is, what are the forms it can take. And I, I don't feel like it's, it's a kind of a, something I could, ne could ever hope to find the answer to. <laughs> it felt like an, a kind of an inquiry. And so um, I realized that I need to find out more. I need to learn more. And how do I do that? And, and then I said, well, let's bring people together. We were in Bali, people coming from all over the world, everyone bringing so much experience, so many different experiences of what connection might look like. And so um, I had this idea of just having us come together um, in a shared space once a week where we would just have this 45 minutes dedicated to exploring connection with nature, 45 dedicated to exploring connection with ourselves and 45 connection with others. And in each of those slots, I was just going around my week and looking for what are some gifts that others might have to bring into this exploration, whether they had any kind of background or certification in that or it was just something that they were personally exploring, they felt passionate about and it was authentically present for them to be able to share in the form of an experience rather than um, you know, a lecture or something like that. So it was more of this workshop kind of style exploration of, of different practices and things, which was just my way of, of creating a sort of a university, really, <laughs> for what, what is connection? And I... I stayed with that for a while, while I was in Bali. And it, it enriched my life in such incredible ways, just this way of community and coming together with this inquiry. And, um, and afterwards, uh, for a few years, I was traveling back and forth between my home country of Bulgaria and um, Romania, where my partner was based. And, you know, bringing this with me, um, but also like going back to Bali, going to Peru, then going to Guatemala. So it was kind of like difficult to keep it anchored in an offline environment because of all of this movement. And, um, and so eventually COVID came. And as COVID arrived, I remember actually, Jem, you, you posted this invitation for us to um, gather together in online spaces and um, really kind of come back to community through technology. And, and I said, oh, actually, that's, that's a good idea. Why don't I just, you know, reach out to all these people I had connected along the way with? And I thought it was going to be a few weeks and maybe we just come together and explore and, you know, and support one another, gather together in this way um, in an online medium. And uh, it turned out that this was something that, um, that stuck. Um, even now after COVID is kind of fading in many parts of the world, um, it still is here and we still keep on gathering and doing that work in an online environment, which continues to be an incredible enriching experience of community and exploration and connection. Now, I thank, thank you. And yeah, I do remember that. Um, in the early days of the pandemic, it was be February or March 2020, uh, when we realized that the ability to meet physically might be suspended for quite some time. And within the context of the Deep Adaptation Forum, where we were working together at the time, we also then tried to see if people could do more stuff for each other online. 
and uh, and you as well with the Connection Playground. I was wondering, um, there are some theories around how we are losing our ability in some of us in some parts of the world to have dialogue about difficult issues without getting angry and defensive. Uh, there are theories about how we, through social isolation, can start instinctively demonizing others. Um, there are theories then that this leads us to be more open to manipulation uh, through mass media um, for whatever ends, for whatever side of any polarized issue um, might be talking about. Do you think that what you're doing with Connection Playground is relevant to that story of effectively the disruption, degradation or breakdown of normal society because of the atomization of each of us? Yeah, I believe that um, coming together in community is definitely a way to go about this. Um, in the sense that it supports us in self-regulating, co-regulating and having important conversations with one another. And for me, one of the key um, ways in which um, I've been looking to support this way of um, perhaps releasing that defensiveness um, has been just to create an environment of safety and show up in a spirit of, I don't know actually <laughs> the answer to the questions that we might explore together myself or whoever is hosting that space is not coming from this position, I'm gonna tell you how things are, but, it, but are coming from this position of, well, this is a question that's important for me right now. And I have my own position on it, but let's have a conversation where there is no teacher, there is no, central figure that knows what the answer is and and just really coming into that spirit of authenticity through doing that um so i'm not sure if i'm answering your question you yeah no i mean absolutely so because i had i had thought about the importance of effectively feeling loved and feeling and having some sense of general trust in in being alive in the universe and other people that can come from just playing because you're not, you know, if if it's if it's creative, it's emergent. Um, you're not trying to win in the game kind of context. Then, then that's the kind of thing it invites. Um, but yeah, what you've also said there um, resonates, indeed. And I am. Um, it would be great, wouldn't it, if if all of us could uh, have more play in our lives. I'm just realizing that something else, though, that you that you 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 said there, it would mean that we we don't we're we're more okay with not knowing. We're more okay with um, we label it failure, don't we? <laughs> like or or uh, and yet, I mean, we've done improv theatre together, and I know you did improv theatre in the Connection Playground, and. I mean, there is no failure. Um, the funniest bits and the most um, exciting emergent bits are the things where it's just all completely spontaneous. So, um, but yeah, that I, I think that also relates to the whole deep adaptation concept, which is, uh, wow, the old answers, the old truths are crumbling. The old expectations are crumbling. Old identities are crumbling. And can we keep some space? for us to play about what what might emerge from that. And it will be different for different people because so many people want to rush into having a, no, this is what we need to do. This is how to stop more harm. This is the way, follow me. Um, and yeah, that, that can come from a place of panic. It can come from a place of um, just rehearsing our own script about you know, how to be a decent human being. So, so yeah, pausing and playing uh, is perhaps is a a methodology in in collapse of for collapse aware people, which um, I certainly knew and valued, and I don't know how much I have that in my life anymore. 
So it's uh, it's good to know Connection Playground's happening. How many how many events happen? What can we all go and join? How do we do it? When, when when's the yeah, next? Yeah, you start? can. You can. We have um, around maybe three to four gatherings happening each week, and they're all based on donation, and they're co-created with a bunch of other beautiful humans from all over the world. We also have spaces in which we come together to actually be in that spirit of co-creation, be in that spirit of, okay, what is present for us right now in our connection with self, other, and nature? And then joining forces around common threads in order to create spaces that we can explore together. So, so there's a lot of collaboration happening. Um, there is a lot of, yeah, just, just, uh, play really like just just allowing for us to come together um, in this way and one thing that also I wanted to mention as I was listening to you is there's something about perfectionism it's something about you know just releasing this need for everything to be perfect for everything to be um, told out before it happens for everything to be controlled and, and structured and, and clear and somehow allowing a bit more space for, you know, um, emergence to actually take place, for creativity, for um, really allowing our, our life force to kind of guide us to places where we might not be able to go if it would just be so, like, trying to get everything right and not fail. Um, so, so that's something that's been a big medicine for me coming from a heady, perfectionistic kind of place in the kind of work I was doing before. Yeah, I remember you once told me that, so if old ways of being and doing are crumbling, then uh, we know we want something new, but how are we going to discover what's new unless we play around with that? Like, how can we think that we can work it all out from our current way of being and doing exactly which one we're going to transition to? Like, like, how silly is that idea? that we need to know before we then move into the new way of being. And what, why not just realize we've got to play and experiment and trust emergence. And, um, and therefore that it means also welcoming diversity of experiment rather than just uh, having this judgmental attitude about people doing different things and saying, no, 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 that's not the way to go. It's this way, not that way. So um, yeah, and, and, and that for me also is very much alive when anyone's talking about then things which are very important to me, like maintaining social justice human rights um but then that can come with a, a, a flavor of judgmentalism about well hmm, like where's the activism in what you're doing sorry is this inactivist is this giving up on the climate fight um uh so you must have heard that or maybe you, you don't hear it but i certainly do um and i've often responded to say well so many people have transformed through their collapse anticipation and collapse awareness and are active in so many different ways. But I realized perhaps there's another way of responding to that, which is, well, who are you to decide what activism is or isn't and, and what has an impact or not? So was, any, any thoughts on this? Because this, it's quite a live debate about people wanting to label people doomers, apathetic um, and giving up. Mm. Yeah, I guess I guess that brings up the question of what does activism mean? You know, it's kind of like because um, activism is taken to mean okay, we go out in the street, we protest, we we create projects that perhaps support um, another way of being, and this for me is also a project that supports another way of being um, because it um, it has this element of bringing us together to reconnect with nature. Uh, and with ourselves and one another, which is a kind of a soil for other kinds of activism to emerge from. So when we are ourselves in a in a state of well-being and um, self-regulation and um, and creativity, and we are open to actually c connecting with nature in different ways, then nature nature plays a bigger role in in our awareness and then we can bring more uh, action also that is aligned with bringing more awareness to nature and, and our connection with it. Um, so you're touching on something there that I want to 
explore a bit more. But before I ask you about it, just to say um, for, for uh, all of you who've joined us today, uh, please, if you have a question for Zari, uh, do send it to Katie Carr through private message. And then we'll be coming to you in about five minutes uh, to, to, to hear your questions. And also, Katie, if you have a question for Zori, maybe we, we go to you first as well. Um, so, Zori, you just mentioned about being open to nature, to be... Um, so what I think I'm beginning to hear then is, and you've said it earlier before about the idea of the fear of failure, the desire for control, the uh, expectation that perfection is possible and good, and to be a responsible human, you must always achieve perfection or try to. All of that is within a particular idea of how to know the world and how to interact with the world. And you called it heady as well earlier. So my sense is you have been very alive to a different way of sensing, a different way of welcoming insight, a different way of sense making and being guided by nature, universe, energies, whatever. Um, could you tell us anything about, about that? Because it really doesn't get much space in um, the kind of conversations I have in my boring academic or activist life. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful question. Thank you, Jim, for asking. Um, yeah, this reconnection with nature, actually it opened up uh, for me through the early stages of the Connection Playground, because each week there was a slot that was, oh, we, we, we have 45 minutes to do something related to nature. And actually, it was very hard to find people that can offer a kind of an experience of connecting with nature, although we had this beautiful garden in Bali where we could do that. Um, people had lots of things in, in relating with self and other, but very few things in relating with nature. So Usually that was my, my challenge to, <laughs> to go through my week and to actually be watching what's happening in my own connection with nature that I could offer as a shared experience with others. And through time, um, also through my own spiritual path that is related to shamanism, which has brought me to places like Peru and Guatemala and Bali before that, um, I've also been exploring, um, yeah, just, just this different way of being with nature where um, I guess it's just about going out, not just with the intention of I'm, I'm just going to spend some time with, in nature, but really meeting nature and meeting the beings of nature as a sacred other um, or as a part of myself. And, um, and there's been a lot that I've done in this direction, like, for example, uh, last year, when I was here in Guatemala, I live like, right next to uh, Lake Atitlan. And I, I had this agreement with the lake that every day I used to go and um, actually open up to receive a message from the lake through a certain quality. Maybe today I would see like the algae in the water or maybe I would see, um, you know, the way that the sky was reflected in the water or something else. And every day I would get that specific message or quality of transparency or um, pinkness or <laughs> whatever it was or sometimes dead fish you know just just whatever really arrives at that place where I'm about to go and, and, and have my swim I would take that quality with me and I would take it with me in my day see how it expresses and then come back the next day and report <laughs> like, so I, I had this like many different ways of just really starting to acknowledge that lake, not just as a, you know, an object, but like as a being in its own right that I can have a conversation with and, um, and I can really open up to receive its wisdom and, and learn from. Uh, so this has been something that, yeah, I've, I've sought to, to embody as I walk through my life, looking at Okay, so um, really this larger organism that I'm part of and all the beings that I can meet, whether it's a human being or it's an ant, and how, how can I open up to the wisdom that that ant carries as well and um, converse with it? So that's something that's very typical of 
animistic and uh, shamanic traditions and it's something i'm very much aligned with and it's also the reason why i'm i'm, I'm sitting here <laughs> in front of my chair um <laughs> you know some people have laughed because usually <laughs> it's like they see a chair and then i'm like coming in it's like why don't you sit on the chair <laughs> Um, and, and for me also, there's something about the connection with the earth actually here in, uh, in Guatemala, which is the land of the Mayans. Um, the women used to actually not sit on a chair, even if a chair was there, because it was actually seen as very nurturing to be more closely connected to the earth for a woman specifically. And I, I didn't know that before coming here. It was, it was, it was something I was doing anyway. And, and I continue doing it. And, and so there's all of these little ways that we might not be so conscious of, but are energetically very important to our well-being, as is the connection with the earth itself. And so shamanism for me has this way of like bringing us back down. So shamanism and, and what you've just described, uh, for my understanding, there's, there's a there's a niche in the so-called modern or western world where that is embraced and there's also maybe another field where it's observed and thought of as a curiosity but the majority of the people i know would quietly laugh at you or aggressively dismiss you if you ever want to take any of these ideas anywhere near normal life and and you have this lightness you ha you don't seem to ever get angry about that being the way of the modernist world or the patriarchal world um do you experience patronizing negativity and dismissal and 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 or not but if you do do you just how do you deal with it how do you not get angry given that there's not only a, a dominant dismissal of what you've just described and the lack of embrace but also that comes upon a history of the violent repression of the ways of being that that you've just expressed yeah so i've i've had my own share of, of processing anger um and it's not been so much around my beliefs and my spiritual understandings. Uh, it's been more around um, really the, the impact that religion has had um, in the Western world on disconnecting us from the earth, from the body, from the feminine. Um, and in specific uh, circumstances, I've experienced very deep rage for that. Um, and I guess in the rest of the time, I, I just see it as, how to say, as part of reality, you know, it's like we don't need to all agree on the same things. And if you don't agree with me, that's all right. <laughs> like, you don't have to. And, and actually, you know, in a way, those that disagree are also part of spirit. They're part of what challenges me to carry whatever I'm carrying in an even deeper way. Um, so, so that's the way I see it. And, um, and so there's this, yeah, just this, this way in which for me, this spiritual understanding is inviting uh, me to look at even conversations like that as an expression of spirit, like this bridging of spirit and, um, and earth and everything we experience. And each and every person that come into my field, if they're coming into my field, there's something for me to look at and something for me to figure out how to respond to. Um, that is also a part of me because this inner critic has been there, especially in the early parts of my journey of, of like, oh, but who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. All of these things. So, so it's just a way of, okay, that's a part of me that is now appearing <laughs> externalized as this other person and i get to explore how i relate to it so you're really taking a playful curious non-controlling emergent vibe to the whole of life including people who otherwise might just be really annoying 
So thank you I for that. To, to meet so many annoying people, actually. Oh, okay. It's, uh, yeah. All right, it's just, I don't know why. It's my world. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks. We're going to open up to questions now. First, Katie, I know you had a question. So if you feel like asking it, go for it. Otherwise, then we're going to be going to Rene after Katie. I do feel like asking it. Thanks, Jen. Zori, will you talk a little bit about your experience of play in the broadest sense that you might understand that and altered states of awareness, what people might call flow states or beyond self consciousness? Hmm. That's a beautiful question. It's yeah, there's been so much there. Um, so um i think it was about six years ago that i first bumped into this what we might call this as altered state of consciousness in a very conscious way um where i first had a shamanic drum journey experience i read about it there was nothing spiritual going on around me and i just said okay 20 minutes drum track you know youtube let's see what happens and it just blasted me off of like everything I thought I knew. It was like, what the hell is going on? Like there's this incredible, rich, um, you know, diverse wilderness that is within me that I've actually never gotten to meet before. And, um, and it's been an incredible support to my journey that I encountered to just saying, oh, let's play with this. Let's see what happens, you know. And um, further down the road, um, I've encountered many different, um, yeah, practices that support that. Um, so, for example, for me, even authentic relating is, is an altered, altered state of consciousness, what we call as deep relating in deep adaptation, um, or inner dance, or, you know, so there's ways in which uh, this can be practiced, um, you know, that does not involve plant medicine, uh, which is a big part of shamanic culture as well um, in some parts of the world that I've visited and um, I've also worked with plant medicine quite a lot um, so with ayahuasca psilocybin mushrooms um, just uh, going into that exploration of consciousness and connection in this way and um, and play has come forth there in big ways especially with mushrooms um, they tend to bring oftentimes this, this playful, wise quality, somehow the way that, um, yeah, really play connects to wisdom <laughs> when, when you're in that state of consciousness has been quite striking for me because usually we would look at uh, play as something that pertains to the, to the child and wisdom is something that pertains to the old age. And actually um, in these altered states of consciousness, I've seen them come together and I've seen how much wisdom there is actually in, in being willing to engage with something in a playful way. And yeah, so, so I don't know if, if that answers your question. Um, but yeah, this is part of my Is there anything well. you want to add, Katie, or any reflection or otherwise? Um, yeah, thank you. Maybe just that part of my impulse to ask is coming from a deep adaptation perspective and that um, I, I don't think it's really appreciated or acknowledged very much the connection between altered states of consciousness, which I'm putting in inverted commas because there aren't any words for it really, and the relinquishment part of deep adaptation. You know, direct experience of the fact that this individual that I think I am is not as much of the picture as I thought it was. Thank you. So, um, Rene, hello. Uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask a question for Zori. Thanks, Jim. Um, hi, Zori. Everyone else is kind of a bit frozen on the screen at the moment, but. Um, yeah, my question was about your experience um, of running the workshops and the, the sessions that you do um, in person versus online. And I guess when I think of play, I think of a real um, physical kind of component to it, a lot of movement. And yeah, sometimes this sort of forum, um, I think it would yeah, just bring a little bit more difficulty 
and just wondering if you'd speak about how, yeah, how those sessions have been for you. Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question. Thank you, Renee. Um, I see how to say I see them as complementing one another, the offline and the online gatherings and the kind of play that we can do in one case and in the other. So um, the offline offers the opportunity to to get our bodies moving more and to get connecting through body more, which is amazing and is irreplaceable. At the same time, uh, the online space allows for, you know, if we look at play in that wider context of exploration um, and cross-pollination as well, um, the online allows for, um, it's almost like different environments to speak to one another through us. So we each have our own bubble, you know, that we are immersed in. And, and so somehow as we come together in this online, online space, there is a play in, in just kind of allowing for this, this like movement of ideas and practices and ways of being between different parts of the world that can then be brought into offline environments or even just for that playfulness that technology allows by just allowing us to connect from so many different parts of the world and share our context, share our ways of being, share our bubbles and get out of our bubbles too, which for me is very much what play does. It, it encourages us to get out of our bubble um, and try something else. Yeah, I've been <clears throat> amazed at the possibilities I, of, of online interaction. Um, and once you have the confidence that actually in some ways, anything that you do in the, the physical realm can be experimented with online, then you just try it, don't you? So uh, a, a course I, I, I teach with Katie, um, we asked a mutual friend of ours, Helen, to have a go at doing improv theatre online, and it worked so well. <laughs> um, you know, you can even sort of just do silly things, like using the fact that there's a screen like this in a box, and like, hello. And obviously people are much better than me in doing these things. But anyway, it's just like whatever context you're in, you can play with. Um, we're going to have a question from Aidan, please. Uh, please unmute yourself and have your video on if possible. Uh, hey, sorry. Hey, Jen. Uh, thanks. It's been a really wonderful chat tying together a few things that don't normally talk to each other, so thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I uh, run an improvised theatre company in my city. Um, and it, as you know, improv historically is much more connected to comedy, the industry of comedy. It is more about uh, fun, making people laugh. And uh, I'm in this weird position where I run a company, I privately uh, am, you know, a, a big believer in deep adaptation, it informs a lot of my life, yet in the company itself, it's not really foregrounded. So I sometimes am playing with this tension of the fact that through improvisation, through play, people are kind of enacting deep adaptation, but, you know, they know not what they are doing. So may, maybe to kind of um, put a little example, like Zoria, I love your example about uh, the shamanism of Gem, your point about how would you be received by some people. If you go to people and you say, hey, uh, nature has spirit, nature speaks to you, you need to listen to nature and you need to play with that, people can go, oh, that's crazy. But if you go to them and you say, hey, I want you to pretend that the lake has spirit, that the lake is saying things to you. If the lake was speaking, what kind of things might be saying? People suddenly go, oh, yeah, like they can do that. So I guess my, it's a roundabout way of asking, to what extent do you think we need to kind of foreground collapse and deep adaptation in the way that we think about play? Or to what extent do you think we just sort of background it and trust the play process as sort of having its own pedagogical value? Um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful question, and I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> I think both, uh, maybe. Um, I think it also depends really on the context we're in. Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing is not necessarily um, targeting to bring people into collapse awareness. However, I do feel that um, these questions of collapse can come up for people. And also, 
um, the resource that is built by just having people explore these different ways of being um, together in this way, even if um, they are not collapse aware and even if they're not even considering looking in that direction. For me, it's, it's, it's a kind of, um, it's, it's looking at deep, deep adaptation a little bit with, how to say, um, less clear boundaries less clear oh these are the people that are collapse aware and these are the people who are not um, because the people who are not they can still feel oftentimes of something's missing something's like what's going on like i'm i'm, I'm disconnected and i want to reconnect and i want to play i want to do these things and and so the resource that is built through them engaging in that and through creating spaces for them to engage in that um i believe is going to be very supportive and the onsetting of collapse um, and also the, the learning also of how do I hold space for others, which mm -hmm. happens in those kinds of spaces. And if we have other ways of knowing all of us, other than just uh, analytical head, then all or many of us at some levels are intuiting what's going on, uh, the environmental breakdown, the societal breakdown. So, so in that sense, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be named. Um, there's just, what did you, you said it once, didn't you, that a lot of people have a sense of something being quite off in the world. Um, uh, there's that original trauma of separation in all of us, if we've all grown up in modernist industrial consumer societies, that we are hyper-individualists, that we that we consume our environment rather than just live in sacred communion with it. And um, yeah, that we carry all carry that. That is something off in the world. So there were, we can all be naturally, I think, drawn to the kind of stuff you're doing, Zori, if we just let ourselves. For some people, you have to have a real shock to just let yourself engage with the kind of things that you're doing. So for me, someone said, Wow, Gem, it took you realizing the end of the world for you to let yourself become more human. In fact, you might have said it worse than that. Like, oh, it's only when you realized you were going to die, you became human. But so some people, <laughs> the shock uh, is actually um, helpful. I want to go for our last question to Neil, um, who's joining us from somewhere else completely different, because I think we've had a couple of questions from Australia. Neil, where in the world are you? Uh, I'm in Hawaii. And um, I'm really enjoying this. Thank you for the work that you're doing, Jim. And Zori, this is the first time I've mm, I've uh, been in a group with you and become familiar with your perspective. I was really struck by what you said around the, about the 10 years. If you have 10 years or less, what do you want to do with that time? And your answer to that was re resonated with me, a similar oh, answer. Yeah. Um, creating something like Connection Playground. And um, when I looked more into that, I saw that you're coming from, you, you have groups on um, authentic relating and circling, which is uh, what I'm doing as well. Just being in the moment, uh, in relationship. Uh, if I could do anything, if I only have so much time left, that's what I'd really like to do. And um, I have groups, mm, circling groups and tea groups. Mm, uh, I'm curious what you were talking about creating safe space. Mm, I'm wondering if you could say more about that, what that means to you and uh, what that looks like in your groups, how you do that. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, and in a way, it's, it's, it's amazing that it's coming from, from someone that's been involved in circling specifically, because for me, circling is a safe space. And at the same time, it's a brave space. It's a space where we come to be challenged as well. And in a way, um, play for me has been this way in which we invite both, actually. Um, so sometimes... It's gonna be just the safety of, of, of seeing somebody show up authentically, which is some, a way in which 
authentic relating and circling has impacted me hugely because the whole spirit of the playground is done in this way of like, you're not just facilitating as like somebody standing outside of the group and telling them what to do. <laughs> you come in and you be part of it. You participate yourself in it and you show yourself authentically. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, there's, there's been that. And at the same time, there is an acknowledgement that we are coming here to experiment. Many of the people who arrive to these spaces and, and start holding space don't have experience doing that. So there is this, this sense of like, can you come in here and know also that it is up to you how you engage here because it's an experimental space. And, and so you take care of yourself <laughs> as you do that. And, um, and, we, and, and how much can we trust one another? And I guess that's been something that's it's safe, but it's also a little bit edgy in that sense that sometimes we're playing around with things that are you know kind of <laughs> you don't know where this is gonna go and can I trust my capacity to handle it and if I cannot then then I just don't enter so so that's basically yeah basically the way that we've been approaching this it reminds me of of the way um Katie on on this call talks about it as well which is looking not at making safe spaces but spaces that are safe enough uh, and other people often talk about it as safe enough for you to go to your tender edge uh, as well which I think is also quite a nice phrase to think about this issue. You're working on this aren't you Zori? You're actually uh, working is it with Maria Perkins on something in this area of facilitation and space holding could you just before we, we end could you tell us about that so people can follow up if they want to? Yeah so this is um, what we're working with uh, Maria Perkinson. Um, she's also a volunteer in the Deep Adaptation Forum and it's how I met her. And she's been also an incredible companion in the Connection Playground in, in its online form. Um, and with her actually through exploring and co-creating for about two years now together in that context, um, at some point we realized there is something here about the way that we be together that we, we feel could be a good way of getting together with other space holders from different parts of the world in the spirit of there is no teacher or maybe nature is the only teacher. <laughs> and and let's, let's just gather together and support one another and create a space where we hold this question of how do we create an environment that supports human growth and, and learning and, um, and just really do that with other people who, whose profession is such. Um, and it's been an incredibly rich experience. There's 14 of us there right now, 14 people from different parts of the world. And there's been a lot of cross-pollinating, a lot of yeah, support that we receive ourselves as we go about supporting others, which is very important in this profession. Um, so this is one of the things that also happens in play is that things emerge out of us en engaging with one another in this way sometimes we find oh actually I vibe really well with this person and how about we go and, and make something together and then how about we make something more together and so this is this mm -hmm. is one of the, the <coughs> things that I I feel is also a big benefit of allowing more playfulness is this, where, where, this opportunity to get that, to know sorry. one another and create hmm? How, how do we find that? Well, is there a, a simple web link yet or not? Um, for the widening circles? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I can share it uh, with you. I don't know if you can post it somewhere. Um, sure. So, uh, absolutely. So, yes. So, um, if anyone's watching this on the YouTube channel, then look below. All the links will be there. For those of you with us now who may not do that, um, sorry, maybe you could just type the link in or Katie type the link in before we go. So thank you very much, Zori, for spending an hour with us and sharing from all of who you are and connected and grounded as you are. Um, awesome. I think you might be the first person I've uh, hosted who sat on the floor in a deep adaptation <laughs> Q&A in two years. Um, Okay, maybe I should do that next time. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And, uh, <laughs> and 
thank you, Katie, for doing the support. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining from Hawaii to Australia and everywhere in between. And um, if you're interested in future Q&As, then Stuart will be putting those in the Deep Adaptation main Facebook group when, when they come available. That's probably the easiest way for you to know about them. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jim.